what what are you guys doing? You you waiting on me? I mean, I was just getting donuts out there. The donuts are pretty good. Did you did you get some? I mean, they're pretty good. You ever, Keith? You want some? Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want some? Yeah. There you go. It's good stuff, isn't it? Yeah. I love those donuts. Anyway, I'm glad you all are here. Glad you came. Thanks. Don't, isn't it weird to, isn't it weird though to wait like that? I mean, it's just kind of weird, right? There was kind of this awkward pause and, and this weird deal. And I don't know about you, but I hate waiting. I hate waiting wherever I go, including on a dull, boring sermon. I hate waiting even for that, right? I mean, I don't, uh, I don't like to wait. And I think I learned that early on. My dad, who was a, a massive man, he was about 350 pounds, six foot one, so you obviously did whatever your dad told you, right, uh, at that point. And part of what I witnessed in my dad early on was he was an impatient man. He hated to wait. He hated to wait in restaurants. He hated to wait uh, in rush hour traffic or even two cars in front of him. He hated to wait. And so I, I remember distinctly learning sort of the motion as a young child that waiting was not a good thing. And so if I'm in traffic, I'm very impatient. And if I'm at a restaurant, and Kay, my wife, can validate this, if I know that it's going to take more than 30 minutes to wait, it's not worth it. There's no food that's worth 30 minutes, right? So I'm not going to wait. I don't care how good it is. I, I just hate it, don't you? Is there anybody here who actually enjoys waiting? Nobody? Man, that's three for three, all three services. They're, oh, you do? No, come on. <laughs> It's just, it, it seems wrong, right? It just seems wrong to wait. I don't, I don't care for it. I don't enjoy it. And even in that awkward five seconds or so, even I, knowing that it was planned, didn't care for it, right? I'm thinking something's going to go wrong and it's not going to go right at all. But waiting is a fascinating, natural, everyday, ordinary part of travel, right? I mean, whether we're traveling to work or whether we're traveling across country on a plane, Waiting is just a part of life as it regards travel, right? We get it in rush hour traffic. We get it at the airport when we have to show up early and then the plane is delayed. How many of you have ever had one of those delays where it was overnight and you had the blessed experience of either spe sl sleeping in the uh, uh, airport or you got a certificate to go to, you know, Motel 6 or something, right? It it's not fun. We, we don't enjoy it. And so a part of our goal in this series was to discover how can we find the extra, God? How can we find the extra in the ordinary. And my hope was last week as we uh, walked through social media that you got some good practical tips about how to discover the extra presence of God even in the common ordinariness of uh, social media. And this week we're going to talk about traveling and the way in which when we wait, and none of us likes it, we've all attested to that just now, that when we have to wait, what are we going to do with this? What are we going to do about this? And how, if at all, can we find God in this? So I'm going to encourage you to pull out your worship notes. And if you don't mind, turn with me to the Psalms right there in the middle of Scripture. Psalm 130. It's a fascinating psalm written with some great wisdom about today, even though clearly this psalmist some 3,000 years ago had no clue about modern day traveling issues, right? And yet I, I think you're going to be fascinated by the way in which Psalm 130 claims for us a way to find the extra in the ordinary. Uh, so follow along with me if you don't mind. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Haven't there been moments when you've kind of cried out to God in the midst of rush hour traffic or waiting in line somewhere and thought, I, I probably don't need to say this, but I'm going to say it, and you shout out something, or you call out something, or you, uh, you, you have those funny um, hand motions that you give to people in the car, right? I mean, we've all done it, right? I mean, uh, well, I shouldn't say we've all done it, but... Um, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. God, just hear me. I'm suffering here in rush hour traffic or I'm waiting for hours unending in the airport or I'm standing in line in the subway waiting for a train to show up forever and ever. Lord, hear me, right? Isn't that the way it feels sometimes? We may not literally say those words, but we feel that sense in our heart that it feels as though it's taking forever and we just want to say, Lord, make it stop. Make it stop. Then verse 4, which is what we need. 
But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. Uh, If ever we've given those hand signals in the car or made those comments across the aisle or said something to somebody that we shouldn't have said, we need forgiveness, right? We need this God who can forgive. We need that forgiving presence. We need that forgiving strength. And so the psalmist is speaking volumes of truth here about the power of God's presence, even as it relates to travel. And then verse 5 and 6 is where I want to kind of hang my hat today because I think there's some valuable wisdom and insight about how to live into the everyday ordinariness of travel and yet experience the extraordinary of God. Hear what the psalmist says. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. Now, in just a minute, we're going to unpack that really well because we just got through saying we don't want to wait. We don't like waiting. And yet God is telling us to wait. So listen and wait for that word. My soul waits for the Lord. I'm sorry. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So in your worship notes... I think it's fascinating that the psalmist has claimed for us a way forward to discover the extraordinariness of God, even in the ordinariness of travel, because there's not a one of us who really enjoys that stuff. We know we need to get from point A to B. We know we need to achieve uh, this traveling circumstance, but we, we don't like the waiting. We don't like the delay. And it's interesting because in order to find the extra in the ordinary, we've got to do a few things that we might not normally do. So here's what I want to say. The first is uh, there in verse 5, he says it at least twice and a third time in verse 6, wait, wait. Man, we just got through saying we don't want to do that. We don't like doing that. But hear me out. Here, what we're looking at is a different kind of wait. For most of us, wait means stop, delay, pause, uh, I'm waiting for something to happen, right? And, and we've all just owned the fact that we don't care for that. We don't want to do that. But here, the biblical word that's translated into the English as wait actually means something like this, an expectant anticipation. That's really different, right? An expectant anticipation. And you might think to yourself, well, why don't you just put that in there instead of writing the word wait, right? Right? Well, it's much like this other word that we sometimes get confused on in in the Old Testament. Remember, there's a few passages in um, Proverbs and and, uh, Jeremiah uh, that says we must fear the Lord, right? And when we see that, we kind of go, well, why would I want to be afraid of God? That that seems counterproductive. I don't want to be afraid of God. But it says right there, fear the Lord. Well, of course, that, that Hebrew word fear doesn't mean to be afraid. That Hebrew word fear means to have reverential awe. In fact, that same Hebrew word is actually there in verse 4 from which we just read. And it said to revere God. We're to revere God even though often that word is rendered as fear. Same way with this word wait. It is not pause or delay or just kind of hang out. It is with anticipation. I expect that something's going to happen. It's the watchman, right? It said, uh, more than watchmen in the morning. You know what these watchmen were doing? They were getting the group, the village, the tribe, the people ready for the next day. They were to keep watch for the new possibilities. And so they were always waiting, but they weren't just pausing or being delayed. They were with great anticipation and expectation awaiting the possibilities. It might be like um, a pregnant woman right? Um, A pregnant woman is always waiting, 
but she's waiting with great anticipation and expectation because there's no pause or delaying, right, with pregnancy. I mean, I got to get ready. My body has to reshape and reform. My head and mind has to reshape and reform. My home has to get ready. My clothes have to get ready. My husband has to get, all of that stuff has to get ready, right? And there's great anticipation and expectation in the waiting. So I wonder what might that look like in the waiting of travel? When we're hanging out in rush hour traffic on I-35 South and we can't go nowhere. When we're on the airplane or waiting rather in the airport and it's now been delayed for yet a third hour. We're waiting for a subway train after a show in a large city and it doesn't seem to be coming. What might we do with this expectant anticipation? I reckon it's kind of like Mary who birthed Jesus, right? We're told in Luke's gospel of the story of the birth of Jesus. And Mary as an adolescent, as a teenager, was told this was going to happen, right? And in Luke chapter 1, the angel comes and speaks to Mary and expresses all that's going to happen. And then in verse 38, Mary does the expectancy thing. She says to the angel and to you and me, Um, I am the servant of the Lord. May everything that you've just said, may it be true. What she said is, I'm ready. I'm not there yet. I don't understand it all, but I'm going to wait with great anticipation and expectancy that God has got something in store for me. It's really cool. It's much like the woman that Jesus encounters at the well as well. She is a Samaritan. No respecting male would have ever encountered her during the day, but she's at the well drawing water. Jesus shows up at the well to draw water, and a good Jew would never converse either with a Samaritan or with a woman in the middle of the day. But on this day, Jesus encounters the woman. They have a great conversation. He's trying to help her see that he is the living water. And in part in the conversation, he asks her about her faith. And she expresses it this way in John chapter 4. I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. I know that he will save us, and I know that he's on his way. She's got great anticipation, great expectancy. And in this case, it is all fulfilled because Jesus says to her, I am the Messiah. You see, it's this kind of anticipation that we're talking about. And so I wonder in those moments when we're caught in traffic or on in the airport, what might we do with this time in order to expectantly anticipate what God might do? And I wonder if it might look something like this. Some of our spiritual practices can help us. Things like prayer or scripture reading or even sort of uh, doing a devotion that we might encounter. And so while we're waiting, maybe we could pray for the people who are waiting with us in the airport or in the traffic. Or maybe we could pray for the expected destination and the people to which we're going, whether it's at work or home, whether it's uh, on a trip or a journey, and we're going to meet new people in a new country. Man, what a cool deal would that be? Because remember, conversa- prayer is purely conversation with God. So while you're driving, you can do this. You don't, don't close your eyes. We can converse with God with our eyes open, right? We can have a dialogue with God that just claims God's presence. Because when all is said and done, this waiting, as your notes indicate, it is a discovery of God's presence in the moment. And when God is present, somehow it changes things. Somehow it makes things different, right? And all this is is an acknowledgement of what already is. God is already present. God is already real in the moment. And even though we don't want to be there because it means we're waiting, God is there. And therefore, why not make the best of the moment as we wait, expectantly anticipating what is yet to come? Well, so how, how can we read Scripture? How can we have a devotion? Well, That's where this instrument comes in that we all have a love-hate relationship with, right? We can pull this puppy out, and gosh, if you've got the TMUMC app, guess what you can do? You can read Scripture. 
Or perhaps you've got verse loaded on your, Bible, your phone, and therefore you've got God's Word with you, and you can read God's Word. And I'll tell you, most of the time, not all the time, I discovered this early on, most of the time when I read Scripture, I am comforted. I am renewed. Now, of course, there are those challenging passages that either don't make sense to us or tell us to do things we don't really want to do, like love our enemies and pray for them. But most of the time when I read Scripture, man, it comforts me. And these puppies can have all kinds of devotions. There's all kinds of online devotions that our phone can have. So let me just give you a tip. Don't do this while you're driving. Now, if you're stopped and you know you're going to be stopped for a while, then have at it maybe. But, but you can do this at the airport, right? We could do this in the line uh, of the subway train or the uh, boat that we're about to take out or the cruise line that we're about to ship out on, right? We can do this. And all it is is a way to wait with God so that we can anticipate what God has in store for us. It's a great way to live into the extraordinary in the midst of the ordinary. We all have that time, right? Because we're doing nothing but waiting. So let's wait this kind with great anticipation. The second thing the scripture tells us from Psalm 130 that helps us to find the extra in the ordinary is that last phrase of verse uh, 5 where it says, and in God's word do I hope, right? Hope. Hope is a huge gift, right? Hope says to me, no matter what my circumstances are now, which I hate because I'm waiting in line in traffic or at the airport, I don't like it, but I hope that it'll get better. I hope that I'll get to my destination. I hope that I'll meet the people that I want to meet. I hope that this sermon might end sometime quickly, right? (laughs) Hope is a good thing, right? Hope is the opportunity to know that somehow things are going to get better, right? So that even Job, the man who lost everything, all of his livelihood, all of his family, the Old Testament tells us, right smack dab in the middle of the book, Job professes this great proclamation. Job chapter 19. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Remember that song? Powerful song. I know that my Redeemer lives. And that's a heart no and a head no. I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to have all the facts. But I need to know by trust and faith and belief that my Redeemer lives. That there is something beyond this horrible God-forsaken moment in traffic or at the airport. I hope beyond this moment, right? I love the way the Apostle Paul put it. When Paul writes to the church at Rome, he is so profound. He's so impactful in the words that he says and the phrases that he uses. But in particular in chapter 8, he has this great um, imagery of hope. He says, now in hope you have been saved. Now hope that's seen, that's not really hope for who hopes for what we see, but rather we hope in what we don't see and we do so with patience. That's that waiting, that's that anticipation, that's that expectation that it's going to get better. So the only way, or or one of the ways rather, to find uh, the extra in the ordinary is to hope. And when all is said and done, as your notes indicate, this is the discovery of the best that can be, right? The best that can be in every situation. So even when I hate this moment, even when I I really would just love to extract myself from the car or from the airport or from the train station, I'm hoping that something will arise that's better, right? And this can take shape in a lot of different ways. Uh, This might take shape in the reading of God's Word because in the reading of God's Word, what I discover is it's not just about me. There's more to life and faith and this world than just me. And so a part of what that does is maybe I can begin to think about the other people involved. Maybe I can begin to wonder, because isn't wondering, I wonder if this is true, I wonder how that can be. Wondering is a powerful gift of hope, right? I wonder if this will ever end, right? I, I wonder if there's something better in this set of circumstances. And in particular, I wonder why that guy cut me off. I wonder... Maybe if his day has not been really good or if something horrible has happened that's caused him to be impatient, I wonder what his day is like. I wonder what this person who's been behind me and on my tail all commute long, 
I wonder what's going on in their life. And wondering is a fascinating tool to help us move beyond the moment, right? Because in that wondering, even as simple as it is, I'm, I'm no longer thinking about how horrible this moment is or how much I hate this waiting, but rather I'm beginning to wonder about God in the midst of it all. Hope. I, I wonder what it'll be like when I get there. I hope that I'll have great joy in the journey because here's a part of the reality of travel, all travel. You really already know this, but the reality of all travel is the journey is much more important than the destination. It's really cool to get there. It really is, particularly if we're going on vacation. But the journey, just like faith, just like life, Anytime we travel, the journey is more important than the destination. And there's where the hope is. Because even in the given moment, I can let it go and move beyond what I cannot yet see to discover the best in all circumstances. So the psalmist says this, we got to wait, expectant anticipation. Uh, we must have hope. God gives us hope. That's the very essence of who God is, is a God of hope. So even in this uh, horrible moment of waiting, I know that something will happen that's better. That's a mind and a heart set. But third, and the way to discover uh, the extra in the ordinary, notice verse 6. More than watch those who watch in the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. They're getting ready for the possibilities. They're getting ready to inform everybody else about the possibilities of a new day. We need to watch. Because how many times when we've gotten caught in rush hour traffic or we're waiting in the airport, we don't watch much of anything, of course, except in the airport when we people watch, right? I mean, there's nothing more fun than people watching, right? But even in the people watching, isn't it fascinating how when we people watch, we can sort of see the image of God, even with those who don't seemingly have the image of God in them based on what they're doing or saying or acting, right? That's a part of what this means. A part of what the psalmist is saying to us is, look and see where God is in the moment. And the psalmists do this so well. There's so many different psalm writers, but psalm, uh, the one who David wrote Psalm 27, we're told. And Psalm 27 says, um, just literally, I truly believe I will live to see the Lord's goodness. I wonder if I can watch for that goodness when everything seems to be going to heck in a handbasket in the moment, Right? I love the way another psalmist put it in Psalm 66 when he said, uh, look and see, come and see that God and what God has done and how God is having an impact on the people. So I wonder if while we're stuck in traffic or while we're hanging out at the airport or why the line to the subway seems incessantly long, crowded like sardines at the station, I wonder if we could watch for the beauty of creation, for the way in which God is active in those people's lives, just like mine, for the way in which God has put all things into motion, including that which has ceased in its motion for the moment. You see this watching, as your notes indicate, it's a discovery. It's a discovery of God's handiwork in all things. You see, when we get so perturbed about the stopping of motion in the waiting of our traveling, how easy it is to turn inward and woe is me and how horrible is this and I lose sight of the God who is real and the God whose handiwork made all traveling possible. So maybe one of the things we can watch for is the possibility that I'm even traveling at all that I have a car, no matter how old the jalopy is, right? 
or that I'm able to afford an airfare to go somewhere, wherever it may be, or that I can find myself even on public transportation because our community believed it was that important that people have the capacity to travel to and fro. You see, when we wait and we hope and we watch, we become different. And the extraordinary God claims us and uses the moment well. And then what I believe happens is what the psalmist says at the very end. Now, the psalmist, as I mentioned, of course, had no idea 3,000 years ago about public transportation or about airfare or about uh, motorized vehicles, right? But what they did have was a recognition that Israel would be redeemed, that is to say, made new, to be paid for in the living and the righting of that which was wrong. And I wonder if there's not truth in that statement about not only the redemption of Israel, but the redemption of us in the moment of the waiting. That if we will choose to anticipatorily expect in our waiting, if we choose to hope in our waiting, if we choose to watch in our waiting, that we won't be redeemed. That we will sense and know that our souls have been made over and that we can discover a great joy because God is with us and God is for us and God goes in front of us. And in all of that traveling, whether stops or fits or endings, then we can really know that there is an extraordinary God who wants to do extraordinary things even in the horribly ordinariness of life. Thanks be to God that we have that gift. May we challenge ourselves in the days that lie ahead to wait and to hope and to watch. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, Thank you indeed for the gift of your love, for the wonder of your creation, for the hope that you provide, and for the opportunity we have to wait with you so that you can claim us for greater good in the world. God, this is our prayer, and we lift it in the name of the one who gives life and gives it abundantly, Jesus. In his name do we now pray. Amen.